everybody, and welcome. My name is Sheila Andreen, and it's spelled like Skilla, S-C-I-L-L-A, but it's pronounced Sheila. And I'm the CEO and co-founder of IndieFlix. I'm also the founder of the IndieFlix Foundation, and I produce and direct movies. Um, I'm probably, I don't think anyone really knows. I'm not that big and for, <laughs> for people to know who I am, but I suppose if you knew me, uh, I'd be known probably... I've been told I've been known for my laugh. Uh, I have an infectious laugh, I guess. It's hard to know because I'm in it. Um, and I've also, um, some people might know me from my costume design days where I uh, designed The Wonder Years, Party of Five, Dawson's Creek, Smallville, What I Like About You. I did a lot of uh, years in Hollywood as a costume designer. And my current project is a really challenging one that is changing my life. It's called Race. And it's a documentary about the effects of race and racism on our mental health and how we can promote racial healing. Sheila Andreen, welcome to the Make It Podcast. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> well, thank you. And you're so modest. You're so humble. The, the one thing that, uh, it's so full of joy, by the way, uh, that, that thing about your laugh is, is sort of renowned. That is true. Um, the thing I've noticed about you is that you've lived a multitude of lives and, and had all these careers and have done well everywhere you've went. And it makes it challenging actually to interview you because where do I go? What lane do I go down? How do I bring the most value to the audience? But we'll get into that. I want to start off with a short bio. And as I always say, this is the internet. So if something's wrong or is inaccurate, just correct me at the end and, and we'll, we'll get it, we'll get it uh, ironed out. CEO and co-founder of IndieFlix.com, Sheila Andreen is a producer, director, and Emmy-nominated costume designer with deep roots in the entertainment industry, producing several award-winning films, including festival favorites Outpatient, The Flats, and Sundance hit Bit Players. Her first film, Mutual Love Life, received Oscar consideration. Sheila has worked in print, television, commercials, industrials, and features here and abroad. She has spoken on numerous panels at Sundance, South by Southwest, F Women in Film, and is immersed in film-related organizations. She began her career in film while attending NYU as a political science major, working part-time as a photographer covering the United Nations for the Wall Street Diplomatic World Bulletin. She and her partner, Carlo Scandiuzzi, and please tell me if I pronounce that correctly, created Indie Flicks to be a fee-free one-stop shop for filmmakers to reach the broadest online audience while keeping their rights and the lion's share of the profits. She's spoken on numerous panels and immersed herself in film-related organizations worldwide. You mentioned this at the top of our conversation about the way your name is spelled. What is the story behind why your name is spelled S-C-I-L-L-A instead of the traditional spelling of Sheila? My mom, that's all my mom's and dad's doing. My mother was, my mom's Chinese. My dad is Swedish, French. And my mom was a, a, an understudy for an Italian actress named Chila. And she wanted to name me that. And my father said, you can spell it that way, but we're just going to call her Sheila. So <laughs> I have an Italian spelling of an Irish pronounced name. And I'm Chinese and Swedish. So it's, um, I, I'm representing lots of different things. That's fascinating. I, we looked it up to see what it all meant. And it's, oh. like, <laughs> it's like, OK, it's a, it's it's a type of flower. It's a type of plant. And, it, you know, it, it usually is blue. It's, it can be white or pink. I, I don't know. It would be interesting if your favorite color was blue, I guess. And then it would sort of. Oh, I am wearing blue. I mean, it's funny. Navy blue and black and white are really all I wear. Um, and sometimes a little bit of orange. But um, it was also growing up, it was, uh, I was teased a lot because of um, the Odyssey, mm -hmm. uh, Homer's Odyssey, uh, Scylla and Charybdis. Oh, and yes. Scylla was the 12 headed monster that ate a bunch of Odysseus's men or whatever. And so it's like, that was, um, that, that was kind of a fun uh, time. <laughs> Kid, kids will find anything, right? Like I have the most common name, I think. Chris. <laughs> of, in mankind, since it's like Chris is a, a, a truncated version of Christ. And, you know, the kids will, hey, Chris, piss. And it's right. like, <laughs> like, that's not even funny, but they'll do it. They'll, they'll figure it out. Um, 
I want to start at the beginning with you, sort of talk about how this all got started. Was there a movie you watched over and over again in your childhood? Or what was that movie you watched over and over in your childhood? Well, it's funny. In my childhood, in those days, you couldn't watch a movie over and over because we didn't have on demand. Mm -hmm. I now watch my childhood movies whenever I want because I have them saved in my DVR or in my library. But in those days, there were movies that absolutely, you know, had a pretty incredible impact on my life um, after one viewing. Um, a couple of them, one, of course, was Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, the original one. Mm -hmm. uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, where I felt I left the theater feeling guilty that I was cheering for the bad guys to win. <laughs> and, um, of course, um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, Audrey Hepburn was, mm -hmm. you know, I had to go live in New York, which I did. And um, so there were movies that impacted my life. There are lines from movies or scenes from movies that have helped to shape who I am. Um, so movies being, um, you know, in Breckenridge, Colorado, my father was a developer. So we lived in a little old mining town before it was a popular ski resort. I was the only kid of color in the entire county. And so I didn't have any friends wow. and I was bullied severely. So it was me and my dog and TV. So I grew up watching TV and going to the little broken down theater with my parents on occasion. And that was that, that media, that content, those stories were really my community and helped shape who I, th that and books as well. Yeah. It's, it's amazing what film can do when you need to escape to a place. For, for me, those movies were Princess Bride and mm. like Ferris Bueller and strangely, uh, girls just want to have fun and, uh, <laughs> Purple Rain and like I think I watched oh, yeah. Purple Rain nine times in the theater, which was unreal. So good. We interviewed an agent uh, named Cookie McRae last year, and that was her story. She had gone through some abuse, uh, some sexual abuse as a child, and film gave her a place. Going to the theater gave her a place to sort of get away from those thoughts that creep. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, the power so, of film. The power of film, exactly. So you talked about going to those theaters. What was the moment that you knew you wanted to live a life in film or live a creative existence? Oh, I didn't. Um, I actually wanted to be a litigator. Uh, I love the law. I have no idea. I came out of the womb that way. I just was fascinated whenever there was like a movie or a show with a lawyer in it. I really loved that character. I loved what they did. I, I grew up watching Perry Mason and Ironsides and L.A. Law and Ally McBeal and anything that had lawyers in it. Um, to this day, I love like um, there's a really one of my favorite shows right now is with Christine Bransky and it's The Good Fight, which was The Good Wife mm -hmm. you know, sequel. And anything with lawyers and attorneys, I loved. I don't know why. And so I went to NYU studying political science um, to then go down that path. And I met a director, uh, haphazardly at a party and, um, that I was working, you know, serving because I was part of the catering team and ended up falling in love. And he did commercials and I, he needed my help on a commercial styling it. So I went and helped him really quickly and, um, made $800 a day. And it was so, um, I was like, wow, I'm working three jobs and going to school. And here I made $800 in a day with beautiful food, really cool setting. And I got to go shopping and fit people. And I thought, I'm going to take some time off and do this with him. And we went on to do like huge national campaigns. So let's go into that a little bit, though, because that is probably maybe the most important chance meeting in your mm -hmm. life. Uh, how did you meet the director and, and how does a poli sci major from NYU get offered a job like that? So, I mean, get offered the job for the catering job or for mm -hmm. the, um, for the catering well, job. Yep. Mm -hmm. So I was out, you know, I needed to pay my rent and I needed to pay my tuition. And so I was, I needed to work. I worked at a place called La Zinc down in Tribeca waiting tables. I worked at a place called EAT, which is up on the Upper East Side. It was a, um, kind of a high-end catering company in Delhi. 
Um, and then I also worked at another, uh, another little a shop in retail for like on a Saturday, but, um, it was at EAT who catered parties for like Bianca Jagger and Dustin Hoffman and Senator Javits. And so I would find myself in these incredible homes and locations, you know, serving. And so it was um, at, I think it was Dustin Hoffman's party and it was on a rooftop on the Upper West Side. And I had the tray of crab blinis with caviar and sour cream. And I, they pushed me out. They're like, go out circulated around. So I had the tray with all the stuff on it. And this guy, Andy was the first one that I came across and he's like, Oh my God, caviar, my favorite. And he started eating it. And I'm like, you know, here's the napkin I'm trying to like pull away. And he's like, no, no, I just want a little bit more. And I'm like, and I knew it was like $120 an ounce. Like it was Russian beluga caviar. And so I was like, I, 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 I gotta, I gotta go. And he kept eating more. And finally, I don't know what took, came over me, but it flew out of my mouth. I said, you know what? You're acting like a pig. And I started to go and he just stopped and looked at me and froze. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to get fired. Mm -hmm. But I knew that I needed to go and circulate this stuff. And he's like, fine, go. So I went and I circulated it, came back. The party ended. I also had to go work at Lazenka. You know, I worked there at nights. And a couple of days later, he showed up and I thought, oh, like I'm really in trouble. And they seated him in my section and he asked me out. (laughs) <laughs> and I felt so bad that I'd been so rude that I agreed to go out with him. Mm-hmm. And we had such, so then this is way too long a story, but no, he no. said, I'm shooting a commercial. He said, I'm shooting a commercial. We didn't have cell phones in those days. Here's the address. Come by the set. We'll have lunch. We'll do this properly. And I said, okay. So I went to go meet him for lunch on Monday and I got to set and they said, Oh, he fell hurt himself and they took him up to the hospital up further up, um, up, up East, Upper East Side, whatever, I can't remember the name of the hospital. So I went up there and I looked, was kind of poking around the emergency room, all the different, you know, triage little and curtains. And there he was. And he's like, what are you doing here? And I said, well, we had a date and <laughs> you were a no show. So I'm tracking you down. And I happened to pick up some sandwiches from EAT because I know he liked, you know, the white fish salad and whatever. So I brought it in and we sat there and we ate in the emergency room. And I think it just kind of like evolved from there. And and he knew that I like to buy things and shop and rummage sales and thrift stores and that kind of stuff. And so we ended up dating and moving in together, even though I kept my apartment. And when um, his stylist, she did coke on the weekends. And so we had a shoot on Monday. He had a shoot on Monday for a big surf detergent national campaign. Yeah. And she didn't show. And so he got a hold of me and he's like, I need your help. Um, You need to come with the here, get my credit card, go buy six of everything. Here are the sizes, no logos, no no this and that and the other. And I got my crash course and I did it. And then, and I never looked back. What a story. That's fantastic. It's, it's amazing time and place. And uh, what happens sort of when you're optimistic and uh, say yes to the universe. Right. You know, that was definitely a universe universe brokered that deal for sure. Yeah. So saying uh, a pessimist gets to be right and an optimist gets to be rich. (laughs) Never heard that. I like that one. Uh, So let's talk about it because you, um, then went on to be a costume designer. You never looked back, like you said, and you ended up being an extraordinary costume designer. Uh, Wonder Years is where you cut your teeth, but you earned uh, an Emmy nom for that. And now they've taken the wardrobe of the Wonder Years and put it permanently in the Smithsonian. This is yeah. unreal stuff. Uh Talk to me about the the Wonder Years experience. So the Wonder Years, so uh, Andy, my boyfriend at the time, then wanted to get married. And I was like, I'm 21, like I'm too young. And so we ended up breaking up. And I went out to L.A. to see my mom because she had moved down from Seattle and uh, started doing like low budget movies out of the trunk of my car. And I watched the Wonder Years pilot, which aired after the Super Bowl. And it was the first half hour sort of um, single camera episodic show. And there was something about it that just 
resonated with me deep in my DNA and I became obsessed and wanted to work on it. And I would have done anything like swept floors, anything. So I found out where the studio was. I went down there and I said, I want to work on this show. I don't know. I, it's just, it's, I feel like it's me. And, and I love the work you're doing. And the writing was amazing. And they said, well, we're not hiring. And I said, well, I'll check back. And they're like, no, we're like, we're fully staffed. And then for some reason, I'd find myself in that neighborhood again. And I'd go in and I'd just say, just checking, you know, and it terrified me to do this. Like not my MO, I would not normally do this. Um, but I was so in love with the show that I wanted to be part of it in any way. And so I went three different times. And on the third time, I kind of got to know the receptionist. Uh, the costume designer was there. She happened to be like grabbing some mail. And I said, I'll do anything. I'll sweep floors. She goes, I could use some help. And it turned out because of my styling background, she was like, great. Can you work for free for like, it's going to take you a couple of weeks. What I need done. I said, I'm in no problem. Even yeah. though I was like, literally I needed money. Like I had now had an apartment in LA and I like, I had to pay rent. And, but I ended up, she had me starting literally sweeping floors and sizing all of the wardrobe that was from the sixties in this cage, which was three tiers high and had a rolling ladder that I needed to size every single piece of clothing in there. And she thought it would take me a couple of weeks and it took me three days. But I, <laughs> what happened was I got to know every single article of clothing. So then she would have fittings and she'd be saying, I think we're gonna need the characters, this, whatever. She's talking to her team and I'm just sort of in the background, but I knew exactly what that kid should be dressed as. Right. And I knew exactly where the clothes were and I knew exactly where the size, what the sizing was. So I'd say, can I, I've, can I bring you some options and choices? She's like, okay. I brought her stuff and she loved it all. So then that's, she just started call, asking me to pull everything. And so then she hired me as a costumer helping her specifically. And then she got fired three episodes later. Wow. Um, she was a little <laughs> high maintenance. Um, but I didn't mind that. I mean, I found her to be not boring, right? Mm -hmm. So um, they brought in someone else. And by then I'd come to know the cast, the crew, the producers, everybody. And um, this woman was lovely. She was so amazing. And so I'm like trying to coach her. I'm like, they like this. They don't like that. You should do this. Here's this. This will look good. Be sure and do that. Get the this particular producer's you know approval first. He likes to be first. So like, I, I kind of showed her the ropes. She's like, why am I doing this? Why aren't you doing it? And I said, cause I'm not a costume designer. Like you are. So you do it. I was really supportive of her. She did not like the politics on the show. So she quit mm -hmm. after two episodes or maybe it was only one episode. So then they said, well, we're going to bring in someone else, Sheila. We're going to need you to train them up. And I said, listen, why don't you just let me do it? Just let me do it. And they're like, you're too young. And I said, mm -hmm. seriously, because I'm too young, I can't do a show in the 60s. Who are you going to hire to do something that takes place in 1800s? Or who are you going to hire to do Moses, right? Like, it's research. So they they said, all right, we'll give you an episode to do. So I did it. And they they were so happy. I, they just I just kept doing it. And then I got a call one day. I was up on top of the ladder at a costume house. And they said, congratulations on your Emmy nomination. And I just said, what's an Emmy? And I said, no. <laughs> And how did I get nominated? And they were like, oh, my God. So they edu educate me on that. But that's how that all happened. And then that just went on to I just went on with whether it was crew that, you know, producers that brought me to the next show or cast. Um, you know, I never even got to put together a portfolio uh, when I really wanted to. Like everyone else had a portfolio and I didn't um, because I just went from show to show to show to show. Right. And I never and then I did make one actually, and it's sitting in a closet somewhere and I've never been able to show anybody. Wow. Because they were like, they are just already, I was privileged in that way. Right. Like we love the work you've done on the one to years party of five, whatever. Can you come do this show? Right. And so, and I, can I just tell you something, which everyone should hear this part, please, please. I don't sew and I don't sketch. I don't know anything about that but what i do know is i know like draping i know if i like something i know if it feels comfortable i know if it fits right so if i can't sew and i can't sketch and i can become a costume designer i'm living proof that anyone can go do anything i think that's i think that's great and it reminds me so much of 
uh, your skill set, particularly not sewing, not not sketching, but understanding selection and being well organized. It, it actually reminds me of sort of real estate and your background and and with your dad. Okay, we're going to do. Um, we're going to build this, this subdivision. At some point you have to get down and pick selections and that yeah. is like picking a wardrobe and you have to know every piece and you have to know what it costs and what it is per square foot and all this stuff. And, uh, it, it may just be in your genes to be super uber organized. And like you said, you, you came out of the womb with a, with a, uh, having passed the bar exam. So, <laughs> so you already had sort of a, a, a penchant for, organization and, and understanding things. And you just applied it in this really cool, integrative way. Uh, I am curious who, who beat you? Do you remember who won the Emmy? Yeah, I do. And that was a whole story itself at the Emmys, but it was the designer for beauty and the beast, which was all about this underground culture of people that were looked half like lions and various yeah, animals I remember that that show. in the tunnels under New York. And she yeah. used to get, I mean, she had her budget was massive. My budget was twenty five hundred dollars an episode for period clothing, which I would rent or go to thrift stores or people's attics and old stores that had closed down in the middle of America. Right. Right. She went to Paris to buy fabric and had a massive team that <laughs> built stuff for her. And she had sketch artists. And she had. And I was like, well, she had to win. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, there's no it's, way yeah. I could compete. Um, so, and she rightfully deserved it. I actually thought, really? Well, I got nominated for what? Right. Like mm -hmm. to me, I, I didn't feel like I'd really earned, like, I didn't even, I didn't feel like I was worthy of a nomination, but I thought, heck, you know, ABC was paying for a limo and, um, which my husband at the time, um, got car sick. So he had to ride up front with the driver and I rode in the back by myself. Nice. <laughs> nice. So now, so now it really felt exclusive. And look, I remember the Wonder Years very vividly. It was one of my favorite shows coming up. And the wardrobe was such a massive part of suspending my disbelief. It's kind of like watching yeah. Mad Men. You know, yeah. um, it's without those clothes and without that accoutrement, then you don't believe Don Draper's story. Yeah. And, you know, the same thing is, is true of, of Fred Savage and, and company there. So I think you were well-deserving. Uh, of course, I'm fast-forwarding many, many years, but uh, I'm, I'm with you. I think that's great. Are there any stories from the Warner Years days that you can share with the audience? Anything that sticks out as particularly funny or esoteric? Oh, my gosh. I mean, they were my life. These people were my life. They're my family. Um I mean, it was really fun, honestly, was being when when I got to make my donation to the Smithsonian and all of the Fred and Jason and Josh and Danica wasn't there, but like all of the actors came out and it was just and and some of the um, it was just really fun to um, hang out with them as grownups with kids and how tired they are. And I was thinking like they've had a better appreciation because, it you know, over the years I then had a kid, you know, like it was just so funny to see them as grownups. But I mean, there were all the behind the scenes stuff. Like there was just, um, we were family. Um, I'll never forget Jason Hervey was in a fitting with me once and he, you know, he was a punk kid and he threw the clothes at me and in one, like a shirt landed on my head and I took it off and I said, don't ever do that again. Like that is so rude. Yeah. And, you know, I felt, and people were like, I can't believe you're talking to an actor that way. Like you can't, school and actor, but it just flew out of my mouth. And, um, he never did it again. I don't think he ever did it to anybody again. Um, we went to a Halloween party and the, the person, Tommy Marquez, who is my right-hand person and worked with me in the costume department, he, um, he would, uh, we went to a, it was Bobby Altman's house and his dad was Robert Altman. And we went to a Halloween party there and Tommy dressed up as um, Norma um, as Allie. So um, with the on yellow ensemble suit and the wig, and he was so good. And Dan Loria, who played the dad was there. And so we have old footage of the two of them just like riffing off of each other. And um, there was one time, and this is really a testament to Fred, um, Fred Savage, who played, um, Kevin Arnold, you know, he was a kid and he would get, he, he was suddenly making tons of money and 
you know, his parents are from Chicago. Joanna's mom was just amazing. And she was out of town one day, holiday time. And the gifts were rolling in from New World and ABC and the studio and everything. He had TVs and, and Walkmans and all these things piling up in his dressing room. And he started selling them to the crew for cheap, right? <laughs> and the crew was so excited. Well, Joanne got back from her trip. She came in and she heard what happened. She was so pissed. She's like, do you have any idea? These people work so hard and they're not given all these free things. So you're going to go and you're going to give back their money and they're going to keep the stuff that you sold them. And you're going to say you're sorry. And she made him go to everybody and do that. And he gave back the money. And then when like Jason Hervey and Olivia Dabo and everybody is driving their fancy cars and stuff at 16 and 17, when, when Fred turned 16, he got Joanne's old Toyota Camry, but they painted it black. So he had a car that had like 80,000 miles on it. And that's what he drove to park in the number one spot at the stage. You know, it's yeah. like, um, but it's so humbling and it's, it's a testament to who he is today. He's like our Ron Howard, right? Yeah. Um, in front of and behind the camera, talented, down to earth, kind and smart. I mean, it's just, uh, it was an amazing show. Everyone on that show went on to do amazing things. So we all kind of came up the ranks together. Um, and that was, um, you know, we have this bond. Yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, those are great stories, and uh, I have I, I would say I can testify to to that about Fred. I mean, I don't know him, so I'm, I want to be careful how I say it, but like I don't know him. But if you watch, like I have him on video and on interviews and a variety of interviews with different things, interviews that have nothing to do with film or TV, he's the same guy every time. So I would. I would completely agree with that. And there's this theme that's sort of going through this conversation, which is people, there are these people who have a false sense of power. And then there are people like you or Joanne that step in and say, no, 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 no. Pump the brakes. I'm still a human being. You're not going to do that. And then the outcome of that is, is really powerful. And I resonated with your, with your restaurant story. Cause the same thing happened to me. I had a, I was working at a restaurant, a uh, wealthy owner. He would come in with all of his f- investor friends. He'd get drunk. And the, and when he would get drunk, he would, he would call me Charlie pride, which was like, what? He thought I looked like Charlie Pride, the country singer, uh, who's who's now deceased. Uh, I think he passed away a year or two ago. Yeah. But um, I would always work the table because I was one of the best waiters there. It's just in, a, in another lifetime. But one time I just got mad and said, my name is Chris, not Charlie. Because it, at first it was kind of funny and cute. And then I could see, you know, intention is everything. Like I could see his intention with the joke had changed. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was embarrassed. He fired me. So I, I didn't, I didn't, it didn't turn out great the same way, but it, what happened is, is a week later he came and found me and he apologized to me. And, um, I felt so good about the decision to give away the job and keep this, you know, keep my self-respect. Um, it hurt in the short term, like, Oh, I just got fired. Uh, but you know, in the, in, in the long term, it felt great. The other thing I want to touch on, cause there was so much to dig into in that story is your decision to, to initially work for free. And it's one of the big questions that goes on in independent film and, and, and independent creatives. There are two big questions that always come up. One, should I go to film school or should I not? And two, should I work for free or should I not? And there's this camp that says you should never work for free. And then there's this other camp and I'm in this camp, which is, Understand the project, but know that if you work for free once, you can kind of form community with those people and then you won't work for free down the line. But I don't know. What are your thoughts? I mean, should people in modern indie film ever work for free? I'm I'm a big fan of working for free because I think. I mean, I, I, I never stopped being paid I had people fighting to give me money I had people doubling my salary to do their show on top of the fact that they knew I was already doing another show because I built community 
I had my tribe, my network, my people. I had so many people vouching for me. And you can't start that um, building of that tribe until you, so put it this way, be open to working for free. You don't need to go out there and say, I'm only going to work for free. Sure, try and get a paid gig, great. But if you're new and you're just cutting your teeth, you need experience and people then more than you need money. That is what is going to, that's what, I mean, I live the richest life, not because of money. The richest life is because of the people I have in my life who trust me and who I trust. And like, they'll hear that I'm going to Hawaii and they're like, well, where are you staying? I'm like, well, I'm looking at the Marriott, whatever. Like, no, 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 stay in our house. It's there, it's empty. Oh, really? Sure. Holy cow, it's a $10 million house. And I'm sitting there and my kids are like, whoa, mom. And I'm like, <laughs> I was, you know, we're six kids, right? Like we were about to get three hotel rooms and everyone's going to mm. sleep with each other like puppies. And it's like, so, you know, it, it's about, it's life is community. Life is about who you have in your life and who you want in your life. And I've worked so many places for free and met people who then dragged me to a paid gig. So that's, there's no downside to working for free. I'm not saying work, no one's going to work for free for years anyway. Now, volunteering for something is good. In fact, I have, you know, mom friends who, whose husbands, you know, lost their jobs during like the, you know, when the world economy went into the toilet and right. so they're like, oh my God. And he's too proud to go get a job at Starbucks. So they're like, I need to get a job. I need insurance. I need to do something, but I have no like current skills. I don't even know how to use my email, right? Like other than on our phone. So I'm trying to help them find work. And while they're looking for work, I said, you need to start volunteering somewhere. You need to start getting yourself out there. People need to see you in action and you need to get your own, you know, like wheels turning because when you start working, you're modeling for the universe and for the world and for others that you can work and this is what you want. And then you will, it will come for you. That's wonderful. Completely agree. Happy to, to uh, debate, friendly debate anyone else who uh, thinks differently. Well, can uh, I also say film school? Film school is just a choice. Like if you can afford to go to film school and, and you want to go there and you want to learn about the history of film and all that stuff, don't go to film school to learn how to operate a camera. You can learn that on YouTube from people in the business and volunteering on a short shoot or whatever. Yeah. But if you want to go and learn about just the history of film and the impact of film and storytelling and, you know, take classes, be sure writing. Sure. I think it's great to go to school for that. But if you think you want to spend money and go to school and that is going to launch your career. No, I, it's not true. But school again is another opportunity to meet people and those people will go get jobs and they will bring you in. So it's, it's, you can flip a coin on the school thing. Yeah, it's true because what happens is you meet someone in school, they bring you onto a job, but they don't bring you onto the job because you were the best at the thing you did. They bring you onto the job because he, you took them out for beer one time. And they had the time of their life. Right. And they know you and they work <laughs> yeah. with you side by yeah. side and you help pull some cable on a little short that you guys made. Right. Like it's, right. We, we hire those we know. Yeah. And that we, and that we get along with and feel like we can have a good time with, we want to tell yeah. a story. We want to have a story with that, with that person. Um, let's talk a little bit about your, your films and, and a few of them specifically. Uh, I love this lane you've been going down recently. You mentioned your film race that's been challenging. You're working on it, but you've had a few before that angst. Uh, you've had like, you have the upstanders. Uh, they focus on conversations about societal issues. Um, it seems like, you know, the, the idea is to change people's behavior, hopefully, you know, heal some people. But to get to that place, I'm, I'm wondering what took you from being a costume designer and being uber successful in that place to wanting to be this mission driven filmmaker for societal change? Um, so I remember I was bullied as a kid and mm -hmm. survived that and then just wanted to be invisible forever. And um, a little movie crossed my desk called Finding Kind that was about bullying mm -hmm. and they were looking for finishing funds. And um, I watched it alone as a rough cut in my living room. And the first thing I wanted to do was to talk to somebody and there was no one to talk to. So I 
agreed to help them raise some finishing funds, but I really wanted to at least experiment and take the film out into community where people could talk to each other. And I knew it was a tough film to go theatrical, but I didn't want it just to be streaming in, um, online. So I took it up to my kids' school and we showed it to the sixth and seventh graders, about 180 kids, and it just transformed that community. The wow. watching of the movie, what the conversation this? after. This Sheila? was 10, 10 years ago. 10 years, okay. And Sorry, go um, ahead. it was so powerful that before we could figure out a way to do it again, schools were already calling us. And they wanted to book it. So it was like, okay, gosh, we should come up with a price. We should uh, make some official discussion guides and give them some flyers to promote it. And so that's how it started. And we used to have like paper calendars on the wall and post-it notes and DVDs. And um, and so that just started and that did, you know, like over uh, 5,000 screenings in like 50 countries. And my own investors were looking at me crooked, like, wait a minute, you're the CEO of a global streaming service. And here you are doing these little school screenings with a little bullying film that really is about girls. And, uh, but it was so, it felt so good for me personally to be doing this. I was never really interested in documentaries. I came from the narrative world of television and film. So that was my world, right? Scripted everything. So being in the social impact documentary space was very new for me. But we were so successful at bringing the films into schools and having an impact. And then we started sending out surveys and all these other materials to measure our impact. And then they were like, what else have you got? So then I went and, uh, you know, I wasn't going to do another one. I thought one is enough and we'll put it online. And to this day, Finding Kind is still touring offline. It does so much business still. And so wow. I did another film called Empowerment Project with Sarah Moshman and it was all her brainchild and I'm like, I'm not, I'm not an empowerment person. Like, I don't know anything about that. And she's like, no, my God, are you kidding? You're amazing. You should make this movie with me. And I'm like, I, I don't, okay. So I ended up doing that. And then we took that out into the world. And then I did a film called Screen Agers and took that film out into the world. And then a friend of mine came to me and said, you need to make a movie about mental health. And I was just like, I'm not doing that because I'm a college dropout. I don't know anything about that. You don't talk about those things. Nobody wants to talk about those things. And I don't even think a school would even book it. She died by suicide, leaving two teenage kids behind and a husband. Wow. I'd known her since middle school and I knew she was struggling, but I didn't know to that degree. Yeah. So I decided to make a movie about mental health and that's what angst is. And, um, and nobody did want to actually book it. They were, um, afraid that if they brought the movie to their school, they only had one counselor and they were afraid that all the kids would line up for that one counselor and they didn't have the means to support what they knew was a real problem. That's fascinating. Um, so, but then a few brave schools started to book it and that film has gone on and booked over 10,000 screenings in 90 countries. And it's, multi I think we've subtitled it into 15 languages and we've now created, um, not just discussion guides, but a full social emotional learning program around it. And in making angst, everyone felt like the reason there was such a rise in anxiety and that we were all battling or challenged with this mental health stuff was because of social media and technology. And I really wanted to explore that conversation. So I ended up making like, and which is very popular and like, you know, technology is not going away. So what do we need to do? We need to empower ourselves and learn how to disrupt our own patterns and behavior with technology and kind of hack it so that we can create balance. And I'm, you know, I have a short attention span and I like to have fun with whatever I do. So I like to present tools that make it fun to disrupt our patterns. And then in making like it came up, why are people so mean online when they wouldn't be that way in person? And that's when I made the upstanders, which is all about online bullying, which is rampant. Yes. And it's not like old fashioned bullying where you can see it. You know, like it's online and kids, only one in five kids will tell someone because it's just words. But those words are everywhere and they're 24 seven and you don't know who's saying them half the time. And it chips away at your self-esteem, which leads to isolation and anxiety and depression and can also go all the way to suicide. So learning about, you know, I learned really about resilience and belonging and community and then um, making that film. And it was probably the most personal because I've been bullied 
And then along came along COVID and, you know, the murder of George Floyd and all this stuff. So then people were like, you're going to make a movie about race. Right. And I'm like, no, not talking about that. <laughs> and, um, but I was listening in the world in a different way. And I was hearing stories that I couldn't put down and that were resonating with me. And I was like, gosh, I wish everybody could hear the story I just heard because I'm so much more empathetic or have a better understanding because I heard a story. And then I started to feel like, I guess I need to make this movie. So I'm making it. It has already changed my life dramatically. And um, it's terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> What's, uh, what's been the most terrifying thing about it? You know, this is the ego side, which is that I'll fail miserably, that I'll be called out on not including this, 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 and this. And you can't include it all if you're going to be under an hour to fit into a classroom period mm -hmm. that I'm not black and making this movie, or I'm not, you know, Hispanic making this movie, or I didn't have, you know, uh, did I have enough crew or like, there's just so much judgment. It's so heated. It's so emotionally charged from every angle. Um, and are you going to add, include all of these things? Right. And so this is about race. It's about colorism, uh, racism. Um, you know, are we going to talk about there? It's, there's just so much to talk about and there's just no way I'm going to be able to No, nobody, even Ava DuVernay, she's got to make many, many, many films about it. We need many filmmakers making many films about this to really be able to share just a little bit of all these stories, right? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. We did an interview with Dr. Christian Gregory, who is the son of Dick Gregory, the first black comedian to ever be on a white stage. And he was helped out uh, by Hugh Hef Hefner early and just ah. an absolute rags to riches story. But he's so much more than that. I mean, um, I, I can't go down the list of accolades. It's, it's too much. But even with this documentary that released on Showtime called The One and Only Dick Gregory, uh, it has 100 percent on Rotten Tomatoes. But you, he still gets the feedback that, oh, you didn't talk about this. You didn't talk about that. You didn't address this. He focused on his health and not this activism piece over here. He's like, there's his whole strategy is there's more films to come. I right. have 15,000 hours of footage on, on my dad, oh. more, more films are coming. So like, don't worry. We can't no, put it all in one movie. That. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. Cause I think that's, well, I'm also doing the series, the race series, because I know from making my last, my past films that people will say, I want to know more about this. You know, like, what do I do if someone calls me a racist? Right. And so I'm going to have an episode that addresses just that. Yeah. All of the episodes are questions that people are going to ask that people have already asked. And, you know, the journey of making this film is a movie unto itself. Um, just the awareness, the, the, the conversations that I have with people. I went to a party once and this, one woman said, oh, my God, OK, what movie are you making now? I know you make these wonderful movies for our kids and schools and everything. And I said, I mean, it's race. It's called race. She goes, oh, you're not going to make white people out to be bad, are you? And I said, I'm not. No, I'm no, that's <laughs> not the point. She goes, oh, my God, aren't you just so tired of talking about this? And I'm just like, yeah, but I mean, can you imagine how, you know, like oppressed People like how so many other people are tired of talking about this, but they're on the other side of the coin entirely. And she's just like, I mean, come on, when are we going to be done talking about this so we can just move forward? And I was just like, wow, we have a lot of work to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, that empowers and a lot. It's true. And me and Nick would be very interested in, in learning more about the series and, and what you're going to do. This is right up our alley. But, you know, I do think that that is the main thing, I think there's a lot of like well-meaning white folks that are just like, I'm a bit exhausted with the topic because I think for them, it feels like a news cycle topic. And then for someone who now I'm biracial, but I grew up being perceived culturally as black and being treated that way uh, for better and for worse sometimes. And for a black person, it's like, this is what it's always, it's not a new cycle topic. It is right. like, it is like a survival 
topic at times. So mm-hmm. keep doing what you're doing. It's awesome. I, I am curious though, you were bullied. You've mentioned that a few times growing up and I mentioned that I was bullied, but, but not nearly to the, to the degree that you were. And I think that's evident. Uh, how were you able to get past or address your own anxiety within yourself enough to make films about it? Did you have to do that? You know, it's funny. I've been asked that before. Um, you know, when you're a kid and you experience something, you know, and when it hurts and when it's toxic, when it's bad and that kind of thing, but you also don't have any other, like, it's all, you know, right. I mean, I was bullied. It, <clears throat> mine was the old fashioned bullying, which in comparison to what online bullying is, I actually think that's easier. Um, you know, mine was kicked, spit on, shoved into closets, locked in a cupboard for almost a day in a classroom. Um, and being excluded, right? And, and always because of being Chinese and um, the the teasing. Um, so I was never like part of the crowd. Yeah. Um, and I always, I don't know what, I think I was just born this way. I have to tell you, I don't have any other re- good excuse or reason, but I remember sitting in that closet for hours until I actually had to go to the bathroom later on. But I remember sitting there thinking, you know, if they just got to know me, they wouldn't hate me so much. Like we didn't need to be friends, but they just never took the time to even really know how to pronounce my name. Right. They just thought the name was spelled ugly and awful and weird. And I looked weird. And, and I just thought only they could know me. And I, I had great empathy. Mm. I actually felt like they're not bad. It's not their fault. They just didn't get to know me. And I don't know why I'm wired that way. I'm wired that way with anyone. And someone cuts me off in traffic and they're assholes on the road. I'm like, you know, they probably realize that their wife is cheating on them and they're just pissed at the world right now. And I happen to be right here. Like I never took it personally, which is so odd. Um, And I will tell you when I finally moved and I was not bullied, I just wanted to be invisible. And that was so nice. And I saw people get bullied and I knew how much it hurt. I didn't have the courage to stand up because I didn't want, I knew it would put me back there. So I stayed a bystander for many years. And then I moved to, you know, Seattle and suddenly got older and people were like, Oh my God, you're Asian. You're so exotic. You're blah, 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 whatever. And they liked me. Mm -hmm. That was really weird. And then I thought, Ooh, I want to fit in. Like I want to be part of the in crowd. And then I finally got part of the in crowd. And I was like, this is what the in crowd feels like. It's boring. Yeah. I'm actually, I spent so much time on the fringe and alone that that's kind of where I'm comfortable. So, um, that's sort of where I hang. It reminds me of something my business mentor, RJ taught me years and years ago, which is the biggest sin or the only sin you can commit at a dinner party is to be boring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> if you're boring at a dinner party, you have, you have out at yourself for life with, with those people uh, and, and your brand. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit about IndieFlix because when you go, and I encourage everyone listening to go to IndieFlix.com, a flick spelled F-L-I-X. And the reason why is because it is such a, um, first, it's a powerful place for independent filmmakers to go. But, but I think in addition to that, Uh, When you really go and look at the films, how you have it broken down into sections. And as an entrepreneur, I know how hard it is to create infrastructure that looks really simple to people that are perusing your site. But that's a whole machine happening in the background behind the curtain. And I just I am a big admirer of the layers. I mean, you click on IndieFlix education and then you can see the film and then you can go and get resources. You can book, you can book the screening. You can have a recorded panel. You can have a live panel. And a lot of work. (laughs) Yeah. You have all these resources you can hand out. It's just like, it's, it's unbelievable. So I want to, I want to touch on IndieFlix and what you guys are doing a little bit here. Uh, But we'll start at the beginning. How did you meet Carlos Scandiuzzi? Yeah, make sure I pronounce that right. And what led you to to found IndieFlix? So Carlo is one of my best friends, and you correct you said his name correctly, Scandiuzzi. And uh, Carlo is married to Laylee, and Laylee's dad dated my mom. So, <laughs> uh, 
and they were living in Europe and he came over to visit and, and I just, we all hit it off so well. And I was, Carlo was 21 and I was gosh, 14 or something mm -hmm. when we first met. So we were just friends. And I also, um, his younger brother-in-law is probably one of my best friends. And um, so we all kind of just grew up together and Carlo and I have always, you know, like dabbled in film. We did a little movie together. Um, and then he called me up one day and he's like, because, you know, in the distribution journey of our first feature film, we learned so much. We, you know, we had an offer from Warner Brothers and we had an offer from Artisan and I'm really dating myself and a couple of other companies. But, you know, when you look at those distribution deals and they were like, you know, this thick, but there was like no cap on marketing expenses. And, you know, ultimately you could almost end up owing them money if they spent so much money marketing your movie and you didn't make enough to cover those expenses, but which they wouldn't collect. But it just felt like there were so many holes. And, you know, we went and talked to Peter Broderick, who's, you know, like really gifted with distribution in the independent space. And, you know, it was so depressing when we left his office, he said, no, this is the state of distribution for independent filmmakers. And, so we just started thinking, you know, this is ridiculous. We should start a marketplace where some of these most amazing films can be represented and we'll make it free. And we can also make it non-exclusive. So if they have an opportunity somewhere else, they're not locked in here. Like there's still an opportunity to have it be out there, get it out there, but also bigger opportunities because it's hard to have a big opportunity when it's sitting on a shelf and yeah. nobody knows about it. And then as time ticks on, it, be, it ages, right? So we thought it was a great idea. And we just kind of self-funded it and um, then went out and started, had to raise money. And it was hard to get filmmakers. They were just like, I don't want to be on some marketplace. I want Warner Brothers to take it or I want no one to see it. It's like, but you mortgaged your house. Like, you, 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 <laughs> like don't you want anyone to see it? It's been two years, you know, you've won all these awards. And they're like, no. Uh. And so it was really interesting just learning the sort of psyche of, of the filmmaker, which I yeah. am a filmmaker. And um, we ended up saying no to all the other offers. And we put our film on IndieFlix to prove that we believed in this. And we launched with 36 titles. I like I, My goal was 100. I couldn't even get 100 because they were like, mm, too good to be true. I don't know. I don't know. And so filmmakers started to then put their content on. But then they went through this, what I call the entitlement stage. It's like, all right, my film's online. Where's my money? It's like, mm. well, you have to market it. Like you're not done. Yeah. Like, I don't know how to market. It's like, well, you knew how to market when you needed cast and crew and money and locations and film festivals and winning awards. You knew how to market then you just carry it over. No, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a storyteller. I'm like, marketing is storytelling. Like, you know how to tell your story. And so sharing that and helping to teach that to filmmakers that you wear this one hat of filmmaker, that filmmaker hat will serve you in marketing as well. And just wanting to talk, teach that. So then creating marketing tools and all these things to try to help. I learned so many things and, um, you know, it was great. I traveled the world. I met so many filmmakers and learned about, um, distribution. Um, we weren't able to make enough money for filmmakers with our own distribution platform because it was so small. So I started to figure out, ah, we'll, we'll add aggregating and I'll get them up on, you know, iTunes and Netflix and Hulu. And so we were able to get the multiple revenue streams, which taught me how all the different deals are, how they do the math, the money, right. and where it goes. And I'm like, whoa, I don't even, I feel guilty taking our part because they take so much and there's so mm. many, you know, errors and different little columns of line items that you didn't know was an expense. And so, um, and then I thought we became great aggregators and all of a sudden Hulu and Netflix were like, what else you got? What else you got? And I was putting together these big pitch decks with everybody else's movies and putting it up there. And I'm like, why am I doing this for other people's platforms? I should just do it for ours. So then I started to do it for ours only. And that's how IndieFlix started to grow. And at one point we had over 12,000 films with worldwide rights streaming globally. And I, couldn't find anything to watch. And I just mm. thought, how is anyone going to find anything to watch? You, you can't just go Ooh, Mission Impossible or Nicole Kidman or like it's all unknown for the most part. So how do you how do you help people find what they want to watch? And really, it's a genre and running time. And occasionally it's a director or an actor. But so I thought 
I'm losing my mind here. Like, I don't know what to do. So I sloughed off about 7,500 titles brought the title count down, pivoted to content for a purpose because I was really enjoying the feeling and the helping and the co- positive contribution of social impact films. And now we're content for a purpose. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's really difficult to have, you know, that many films and then uh, try to manage the expectations of 12,000 filmmakers, for example, that just sounds like a job, that, uh, you know, you wouldn't give to your worst enemy on on certain days, but at the same time, you know, you're being incredibly useful to a community that needs you. There's this new thing now in the, well, I don't know how new it is. It's, it's been around for three or four years, but the micro genre, uh, and then using research and analytics to push micro genre to people, it seems to be working across streaming platforms now. So it's, it's no longer good enough to say this is a comedy. You know, this is a comedy with five qualifiers after it that targets just you. And now we know what, to, what you want to watch kind of thing. And even Netflix will, they'll change the cover art. They'll use AI to change the cover art to, to based on the, your past viewing history. Yeah. <laughs> like if you yeah. watch, if you watch movies that have darker cover art, they'll send you the next recommendation, but change the cover art to be darker. Yeah. Isn't that it's, interesting that they just can garner that information just all online from your usage? From your usage. Exactly. Yeah. Um, you did talk about how Anyflix changed. You have four distinct lanes, streaming, education, foundation, and festivals. How can the filmmaking community benefit from each of those offerings? Well, and the festivals actually, you know, it's funny. I, um, we've changed that to kind of live events. I, there's so many great platforms that do festivals as their core business. I didn't really want to get into that business, but when COVID hit, I think a lot of people came to us and said, will you please do our online piece? And we had the technology to do it. So I, I do it and I do it with Stony Brook Film Festival because I love Alan Inkles and his team. They are yeah. unbelievable people and they are the most supportive of filmmakers of like any festival I've ever been to. But um, we also are doing lots of stuff with like, kids in foster care and like the LA department of children and family services. And like, so we're doing lots of live events there, but then we're also doing like kind of like live performance stuff. Uh, It was more so during COVID. I'm, I'm curious to see how that will morph. Uh, We did a big thing with the NFL and, and mental health. And so I like having that live piece for to partner with almost any organization or a movie that has a mission, right? And how we can use that as virtual cinema. And I'm really looking forward to, which I can't talk about now, but I'm putting together a whole plan to do uh, hybrid virtual cinemas where it's it's like online and offline at the same time. And, um, but they might just be one-offs or a tour of a particular piece of content that resonates with more of a kind of a niche audience, Mm -hmm. but you put that niche audience together globally and it's, it's huge. Um, it can be so working on that. So for filmmakers that have content that might address maybe a smaller population, but still incredibly meaningful and impactful and interesting. Right. Um, and then the foundation piece is really like, I created that to help raise money to bring the programs to underserved communities. And I'll tell you underserved communities, you know, no, they don't have the 500 or $600 to be able to afford the license to be able to access the, the program mm-hmm. um, to start talking about mental health. And yet it has such a therapeutic effect. It's, I mean, all schools need it, but the schools, especially that don't even have access to basic health services, it's just so, so helpful. So then the foundation, and then of course, you know, education and corporations, that's where they can book the entire and license the program for years into their communities. Got it. So from a filmmaking perspective, being able to have a purpose driven documentary or feature is a really great way to sort of introduce themselves to you and and, and indie flicks. And then the streaming side of the business, you know, I mean, we're about 4,000 titles now, uh, shorts, features, documentaries, web series, it's edutainment. So it doesn't have to be uh, mission driven. I mean, we've got a zombie short film with Ed Helms, 
that is about <laughs> bullying, right? Because yeah, he, yeah. he feels left out right. and um, he's not treated the same. And so it's still teaching an entertaining way about bullying. And, um, you know, also we have the classics because we have a bit of a footprint in Asia and the classics are very popular there, but um, we pay filmmakers for every minute watched and um, it's non-exclusive. And that's the key right there. The, the ability to be non-exclusive. Yeah. So what, what does it hurt you? If, if, if we accept your film and you want to be up there, the opportunities are always there to possibly make money. Um, it's interesting. The filmmakers that will call and say, I want to take my movie down. I haven't made any money. I've only made $40. And it's like, okay, I hope you have an exclusive deal somewhere. And they're like, no, but I just feel like <laughs> I need to put it somewhere else. It's like, okay. Like, it's so interesting to, to, to really, I always am curious, like the mindset, the yeah. thinking, yeah. Behind, um, behind the movie. <laughs> yeah. All, all the different choices. We, we always say throughout the entire uh, filmmaking process, all the way through post, a filmmaker will call their film, their baby. But as soon as it comes out of post, they'll give their baby to anybody. <laughs> I know it's crazy. And I think, you know, it's, I always tell my team when you get a call from anybody, a customer, a filmmaker, anyone, um, usually you're getting a call because someone needs something or wants something or is unhappy with something. It's unfortunate that we don't get a call saying, Oh my God, I'm so happy with you guys. I just love you guys. Like people just don't make that call. So sometimes they do. So when they call and they're upset about something, what they really want is to be heard. They want to be listened to. They want to. They want someone to feel like un, hear them and acknowledge them and validate them. And then, so no matter what the what they're going through, we will find an answer together. We will address it together. So we pick up our phone. I'm like, I said, we can't do everything through email. You have to call people and you have to talk to them. And so that our whole team is that way. We definitely need to like, I need to, we're growing so fast. Um, that's a whole nother thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, so someone's looking at doing a services deal where they're basically going to be aggregated through BitMax or they're thinking about coming to Indie Flicks. What, what would you pitch them as, as to maybe the one or two reasons why they should come to Indie Flicks instead of, taking a services deal with, let's say, Gravitas or something like that? Well, I mean, you could also go to Gravitas and say, put me on IndieFlix too. Like, I know those guys. And um, yeah. so it's, it's you know, it's a, sometimes it's a convenience for a filmmaker, right? Like they just want to say, here, here's my movie and, and put it everywhere. Um, like you said, these films are our babies. And so distribution, I wish they taught it in film school, is such a huge part. It's like the last chapter in a, in a book, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the book. And so you need to be able to understand that journey. Windows are still an interesting thing to play with, to build momentum. Um, but also at the same time, unless your movie's some like huge, massive breakout, put it up everywhere and then have fun marketing it to all the different audiences that frequent specific platforms. It's a different audience. Some are crossover, of course, but if you're selling a, a package of goods at Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and QFC and, and Gelson's and, and Albertson's, right? Like there's some crossover of, of, of customers, but there's some that are very specific and you can have different messaging and marketing and conversations that are very specific to your product that will address those customers in those locations. Yeah, I agree. And I think the final frontier for indie filmmakers, and this is something I'm working hard on with my partner, Nick, here at Bonsai, is how do you get fair market value for your film per view? It's a very troublesome problem because you're not going to be able to leverage Amazon who will pay you six cents per every 90 minutes watched on a services deal, for example, uh, they, they actually will bludgeon you. It would be, it'd be the opposite. Uh, but at the same time, indie filmmakers, and this is where the make it podcast comes into play. And one of our missions here, 
some indie films don't deserve fair market value. The, the same value Mission Impossible with Tom Cruise would get, for example. And that's where I love the mission driven, sort of purpose driven filmmaking and documentary making, because those films hold a different type of weight because of the subject matter and the value, the long lasting value the viewer can get out of it. And those films deserve more than what Tubi TV will pay out for a view or, you know, what Amazon will pay. And so trying to tackle this problem of fair market value for a really good independent film is, um, is it's, it's a worthwhile type of work, but it's, but it's a, it's a long way up. I would say. Yeah, I think, you know, the horror audience, they love their horror movies, right? They do. Um, I think independent filmmakers need to really accept the fact that you could actually make some real money, but you got to put the time in Mm -hmm. and the energy. And also at the very beginning, like make your movie for as little as possible. And, you know, when I have filmmakers calling me up saying, Oh, we're fun. Can you fund, you know, are you funding movies? Um, We have a $10 million movie. It's my first feature. I'm the director. And I'm like, does it have to be $10 million? It's four people, two story days, <laughs> one location. Like, why is it $10 million? Oh, we're getting, we're packaging it at CAA. We got all these big people. Like, have you got anybody? No, it's been wrapped, doing the rounds for a year. And I'm like, go make your movie. Like, bring the budget way down. Call your friends. Get out there. Start shooting. You know, when Soderbergh can make a whole movie on an iPhone. I mean, you know, let's get creative. Yeah, it was bring a good movie, too. Down. Right. Yeah. Bring your costs down. And while you're shooting, be sure and grab some marketing assets for yourself. Start sharing it on social media behind the scenes. Include your audience. Build it so by the time you're done, you've actually got a little bit of an audience. And start taking it out. And you, we have to get creative. You're just not going to make the money going up on 100 streaming platforms. You just yeah. won't. You're just, you're just throwing it out there and hoping. So break down your project. I don't care if it's a social impact or a horror movie or comedy. Break it down into what are the products you're using? What are you addressing? Is there a brand that you could get involved? Where does your audience live? Identify five different audience segments. Where are they in the world? What are they like? What do they eat? What do they do? Why are they going to like your film about two guys who comedy biking across America, right? Like start to break down who's going to want to watch this and how are you going to reach them? Where are they on Twitter? Find out those people, get those brands figure out something, do a fun free screening at a bike festival. I don't know, but just start creating your own. Start brainstorming around the thing you, like you said, you, you put your house up for. And, uh, I think the thing is people say, well, I'm ready to pass the baton, but there is the thing I want to get through to, to, to those listening is there is no baton to pass. Like you're married to this movie for life and you need to, to, to work it. It's your DNA. That's right. And That's no right. No one will push it as much as you. And so, I mean, sometimes you can reach people who will go in and put in the work, but it's a journey and it's, can, you can go on. I mean, Finding Kind, look at that movie. It's been out for 10 years offline touring and they make good money. They've got smart. They brought in, the filmmakers brought in brands. They are, they're a whole brand in itself, right? It's not a movie anymore. The movie is the tip of the spear. Now we have opportunity and with all this print on demand, you can create merchandise, you can create, you know, episodes, you can create yeah. sports and outtakes and stickers and, <laughs> gifts and NFTs. And I mean, come on, people, you have a core product. You can make so many things out of it. And it's exactly what you've done with IndieFlix and the the films you've, you've pushed through there. That's a whole program. And the film is literally just the, the, the entry point to this, this massive sort of iceberg that's below the surface of content and value. Um, given today's market, do you see the future of streaming platforms? Um, or, or how do you see the future of streaming platforms? Or do you, I think there's over, Sheila, I think there's over 700 now. Mm-hmm. Now that we know the big ones, but there are over 700. Are, are there too many? Are these all going to get gobbled up? Are they? Or, where, yeah, I mean, where I do, where so. do you see the market going? Some are going to go away because they just can't survive. It's you know, it's so noisy. Um, there'll be a lot of um, bundling, packaging, aggregating. There'll be a lot of you know, 
people coming in and buying up a bunch of smaller ones to create a package of some sort. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I see opportunities all the time of new streaming services and I, I just so admire people who are out doing that. I also can see like how like that it, they could be squashed because if, you know, Netflix decided to suddenly have anime, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much, there's so there's the big behemoth. It, it's, they could crush any small, tiny little anime, you know, um, studio uh, platform. So there's, or they could just buy Crunchyroll. <laughs> yeah. And HBO already bought Crunchyroll. Oh, HBO already <laughs> you know, rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. You know, it's so funny how, so there'll be a lot of gobbling up of uh, smaller ones and rolling them into that or maintaining those as well, but they're really owned by the big ones. Uh, there are too many. There's some really cool services. There's one called um, Stroom that we've partnered with, S-T-R-U-U-M. Oh. Um, and that one is it's kind of a point system. So, like, you go in and you buy some points, and you can have access to all these different streaming services, and you could just watch, and it kind of uses up your points. So it's not like – so that one is sort of an interesting different one. Don't know what's going to happen. There's another one I'm really a fan of called Screen Hits out of the UK, which you go in and you log in and it shows you all these different services. And if you already have those accounts, you go, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then you start watching. And so like, it's aggregating Netflix and Hulu and oh, Amazon cool. and everything in one thing. Cause the one thing I hate is like, is it on Peacock? Is it on Paramount plus? Is it on, is it on Hulu? Is it on, what's it on? And so we're like flipping around to all the different ones to try to find that show we wanted to watch. And thank God for the remote control speaking thing yep. where you can just say like, Oh, Seinfeld. And then it'll show you all the places you can watch it. Yep. And, and the licensing is always changing. So where it was free here, you don't have to pay. And then you think something's wrong and then there's an update and you have to put in your new password and then you can't remember. So you reset it. And then all your kids are like the password changed. And I can't remember what it was because I did it on three things at the same <laughs> time. And it's like, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And you end up just looking for something to watch and not watching anything. Yeah. And so the aggregating, like an app that just does it all. I hate that I can't, I'm telling everyone to watch Ted Lasso and they're like, oh, I don't have Apple TV. And it's like, come on, Apple TV. Like, so it's so siloed right now. I definitely think that it will become the user experience itself needs to get better. Um, yeah. And it's just like TV. Remember when we had like, only so many channels on TV. And then all of a sudden there was like FX and AMC and all of a sudden the cable started to grow. And suddenly we had 300 channels or 400 channels. And you were like, Oh my God, I don't even know what to watch. Well, we're just doing the same thing, but it's online and it's on demand and it's called streaming and it is no different. Exactly. I've always said that the, the customer ran away from cable and cable followed them to the cloud. <laughs> yeah, now cable, the smart cable is now streaming and it's right. just, it's more efficient and you know we like our on demand and it's just the technology is just pushing us to sort of more efficiency but right now we're in an yeah. inundated state nothing new under the sun it's just all these things that we've already had they're just gonna go up to the cloud yep all right here's some rapid fire questions for you sheila okay, okay. all right what are the speed best round. there we go this is it speed round what are the best two pieces of advice you've received in your career and who did they come from, if you can remember? Um, when you call someone for a favor, do the heavy lifting, have done all the homework for them and make it so easy for them to help you. If you want an introduction, write the introduction email. And, and when you send it to them, say, Could you, thank you, help. I'm following up on this email introduction. Here's the email, use, lose, or edit as you wish. And there you go. Like, don't just go, oh, make an, make an introduction and don't give them anything to use for that. I think doing the heavy lifting, everyone will help you because they don't have to do anything. And it feels so good to help people. But you got to do the work for them. The other thing is, don't give up your power when you walk into a room. If you're raising money or wanting to just get some interest from someone, when you take a meeting, you're getting FaceTime with someone. Go in prepared. Be ready. You are not better than them. No one's better than anybody, right? We're right. all equal, but don't, you are not less than them. I can't tell you how many years I gave up my power the minute I walked into a room because I felt like I was so honored and so grateful to be in a room with someone who was going to give me their time, 
whether it was I was raising money or I needed to do look at a partnership or something. I just felt like they were smarter than me. They knew more than me. And I gave up who I was. And I think it's really important that you walk in with an open heart to learn, but you are equals. And think about, is it a good fit for you? You definitely were thinking you want something from them, but is it really a right fit for you? So listen to your gut. Your gut is your radar. Your gut, when you listen to your radar, you won't walk around saying, oh, you know, I, my gut said, I didn't listen to my gut. You never want to say, oh, I didn't listen to my gut. Listen to your gut. It's so true. There are these things that warn us that no doctor can find on an MRI or an X-ray to date. Things like your subconscious, your conscious. We still don't know where that stuff is located. Your gut, your heart. We know where your physical heart is, but there's something else. There does seem to be an internal battle of, I'm getting a weird feeling here, and that might be your subconscious, where your conscious brain says, yeah, but it's such good money, or it's such a good opportunity, or who, who am I to say no? And then, and then they fight. And we don't know where these things are, again, in our body, but we definitely know we have them. It's, it's, uh, it's fascinating. That's great advice. Um, who do you love in film? Who do you want to emulate? Who do you uh, love from a technical and skill standpoint? I'm a real fan of Paul Hag- Haggis. Mm-hmm. He directed Crash. Yep. Um, you know, I mean, I love the oldies. Um, you know, it's interesting as far as like directors, um, I'm, I'm a big fan of Clint Eastwood as a director and, um, I love, is it Regina? Um, Regina King. I love Regina King. And I also love, um, who did the Charlize movie? The latest one, uh, Uh, um, um, also did love and basketball. Um, oh, God. And she's so amazing and I'm blanking on her name and I, me too. she's, uh, amazing. Um, we'll find the name and put it in the show notes. Okay. Thank you. Cause she's so good and I'm totally blanking and I'm seeing her with Sonal Lathan and, 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 um, when she at Tribeca, when she was interviewing, but I can't remember, I'm blanking on her name. Ugh. Um, and you know, I just, uh, I mean, gosh, I'm also like a, I love, I'm a big romantic comedy fan. So like, um, was it Nora? Um, I'm so slow on my names here. It's interesting. Like I'm someone who like, I like that song. I like that music. I don't always know the name of the artist or I like that movie, but I don't right. know who produced and directed it. But I, you know, as far as like actors who also can, you know, some direct, but like Ron Howard is, I love his movies so much. And De Niro doesn't direct, but I just love him as an actor and Anthony Hopkins. And, you know, like there's just some people who I'll always go see their movies. Um, you know, Meryl Streep, Barbara Streisand, you know, like right. that, they're kind of old school. Um, but I, I don't know. I just love good movies and I don't like to be bored. Two things. If you love rom-coms. One, check out our movie, Another Version of You. You can watch it anywhere except any flicks. It probably should be on any flicks. Oh, yeah. I got I to get it on any flicks. Another Version of You. You will like it, I promise. Okay. And then, then the second thing is Elon Musk, his sister-in-law, has a streaming service called Passion Flicks. Uh-huh. And it's only independent romance movies. <laughs> so not porn, but oh, romance sure movies. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. So passion, check, that out. Pa- check that. out passion flicks, maybe a potential partner in, in right. the future. Yeah. Uh, you've seen it all. You've done uh, so many different things throughout your life. I mean, you really, in a way, have touched uh, behind the scenes, in front of the camera, behind the camera. You've uh, been all over the world, even have some real estate in your background and you're doing all these different things. You're a, you're a parent, a great mom, all these things. I'm sure that you've run across many, many new creatives in the business. What would you say are the biggest creative and business mistakes you see newcomers making? You know, I do think that don't assume that just because everything makes sense and the data is there and this is what you should do, that it's actually going to work. And I don't mean like, don't, 
don't have faith, don't believe in it. I mean, have faith, believe in it. But the one thing I have learned over and over and over again is that it's like you you look at something and you think this is going to work. Like this is this is what we need. Da 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 da. Blah blah. It doesn't always work like that. Half the time it doesn't because there's something you didn't anticipate, right? Like, and life's a journey as we go out and set out, as we set out to do things and learn and we start to, you know, accomplish uh, some of the goals. It just uncovers a whole new thing that you didn't know about. So be open. You're never finished, put it that way. And so it's just not a, a beginning and an end. It's, you're beginning something that's going to keep going. So leave enough gas in the tank that you can keep going because you're going to get to that first point and you're going to go, I'm, I've arrived. And then you realize, oh my God, I got a long ways to go still. So you want to, you know, conserve your energy and, um, and it, and you, and it, the journey, when people say it's the journey, it really is the journey. You're going to learn things you're going to get answers to questions you never even knew you wanted to ask. And you're going to learn things and you're going to meet people and life is going to be, and is so amazing. Find that everything happens for honestly, a good reason, a good reason, a reason, a bad reason. You, you decide what you want to take away from it. And let me tell you, there are times, there are things going on in life where you look at that and you're like, there is nothing good that comes out of this. Right. Right. But there is. Yep. There really is. I mean, we lost one of our kids. Yep. Passed away. People were like challenging me on that. And they were like, what good could possibly come from that? And I said, well, we don't know that what it is right now, but there is something good in it. And it was whether it was all the love that we felt at that time that we'd never ever thought we'd ever feel in a whole lifetime or 10 lifetimes. Or, you know, like there's just, you have to be open to that. And I think when I meet people who have these great ideas and they're going to go out there and they're just going to slay it. And I really want them to so excited for them, but know that like, that's not, that's not the end all. Like there's just so much more. Yeah. I agree. It reminds me of the old smashing pumpkin song. Every beginning is an end is a beginning. (laughs) And (laughs) which side are you looking at? Right. That's right. And it leads perfectly into my last rapid round uh, question and you've been so great with, with your time. I only have a few more questions. Uh, filmmaker has got a finished film. They have one month to get it distributed. What are the first three things you teach them or show them? Well, put together some sort of a, you know, a very clean, simple website with your trailer and some behind the scenes stuff and a director statement. And you're like, who's the audience? Tell people who the audience is for mm-hmm. Sometimes people just create a website and it's there and you have no idea who's going to really like this. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and it's amazing how many people don't put that up there. Hopefully you've done your homework before you even started shooting anything about who you would want to go to. And those people actually already know, or they've seen an email or they've heard about it or something that you're making this movie so that you, when you call them to say, it's done, can I send you a screener that you can start sending out screeners to look at getting it onto a major platform if that's what you want to do. Also, start having some test screenings, start having some screenings at people's houses with a bunch of people and get some feedback before you totally lock picture. And don't be afraid to go in back in. So keep all your files handy. Don't be afraid to go back in and change something that starts to bother you after a couple of months. We can do that now. Um, But just have all your, your artwork, your trailers, your snippets, your marketing materials ready. Because when somebody calls and says, yeah, send it to me, you're, you're ready. You've got it. Mm-hmm. I love that. So for those keeping score at home, step one, build a clean website. Step two, start having some screenings, find out what people think about it. Step three, don't be afraid to go back in and fix something you don't like. We can do that now. And probably as a three and a half to go along with your website and your screenings, have incredible key art ready to go and marketing ready to go. Yeah. And also you can hit up the film festivals. That's such a great way to do those screenings. Yeah. Completely agree. I want to give you a chance to pitch your new book, the 
Oh. <laughs> creative coping tool kit. What, what inspired it and uh, what can we expect when we buy the creative coping tool kit? So the creative coping tool kit uh, is, you know, as we were taking the mental health trilogy around angst, like in the upstanders, Oh, is there anything that you, we, you have something for us at home that we can do to kind of help normalize the conversation around mental health. And I said, Oh, there's all these materials we give the school and the school can share it with you. Well, the school was sharing it, but the parents for some reason weren't, I don't know, connecting with it or they wanted more. And so I put a little thing of activities online and they weren't accessing it. And so I thought, you know, I'm just going to write a book. <clears throat> and so um, the 10 activities that are in the book gamify talking about your feelings. Uh. They're just simple activities, all based in cognitive behavioral therapy that you can do with your kids. You can do with your partner. You can do for yourself. You can do in a work situation, a classroom at home camp, whatever. I have a short attention span. I don't like to, I like things to move fast. So it's all right there. And I'd say half of them are things that I did as a kid to hack my own sort of behavior and make myself push through my own social anxiety. I, you know, from being bullied, I de definitely developed um, social anxiety <laughs> and um, which made makes sense. But at the time I didn't have that vocabulary. So I just thought I'm kind of broken. I'm a little bit less than everyone. And um, I found little ways to just push through life. And for instance, I do a lot of traveling and I have to go into places. I don't know anyone and I'm alone. And sometimes I don't speak the language and I don't want to go. I'm like, why should I go? I don't even know anybody. I go, I'll just stay in my hotel room. I've got work to do. You know, I can watch a movie. Like I don't need to go out, but I'm there. I'm for business. I got to go. So I make a deal with myself. I'm going to go into that room and it doesn't matter if it takes five minutes or an hour or however long I'm going to get something to eat, something to drink, and I'm going to the bathroom. And when I've done all three of those things, I can leave. So I go in and I'm always in a hurry. I'm like, okay, I'm going to get something to drink. I'm going to go find something to eat. <laughs> and I will tell you 90% of the time I'm there for several hours and half the time I'm one of the last to leave. And you meet the most people, the coolest people in line for either the bathroom or the bar. <laughs> Uh, I can't help but to agree with that. That's um, that's great, and yeah, the people that the that are there ten minutes before closing, you know, they they really came out to to play as well. So I, I agree with that. And, and Sheila, another thing I agree with, you're amazing. This has been a fun conversation. I've had a blast. Everybody should go out visit indieflix.com for sure. But are there other places where we can see you, where we can find you, maybe? consume some of your work or get in touch with you? Well, where can we find you on social media well, my, and on the internet? I mean, my, my email is online. Like I, I, I don't hide from anyone. I figure people could find it anyway. So it's just there on LinkedIn. Um, Sheila at IndieFlix.com. And, you know, I respond to people. My email box is massive. So sometimes it takes me a long time. Um, but I'm, I'm accessible. I'm, you know, I learn from other people. And, you know, thank you for taking the time and, and for, you know, you did your homework. I'm so sorry. <laughs> There's like, <laughs> um, and I sort of, and it, you know, it's so funny. Like I, I, I didn't, when you read my bio or I hear and see some of those things, like I relate to it, but I feel like. I feel like there's so much more I want to do and there's so much more I am going to do. And like, I can't tell you how excited I am about like the next three to five years and what opportunities lie ahead for filmmakers. And when I said, take your piece of content, your one movie and make multiple things out of it, like create more opportunity for yourself because the world is going that way. It is a creator's creative economy and put your marketing hat on. You have a marketing hat. If you've made a movie, you actually can market. So, um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm really excited for what's coming. I am too. And I'm going to definitely stay in touch with you along the way. And I know Nick will as well. Uh, there's nothing more gracious than giving your email out on a public podcast, uh, but, but can they find you on Instagram or Twitter or anywhere? Oh yeah. Instagram. I'm just Indie Flix CEO. Okay. I N D I E F L I X CEO. And that's where I am on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, 
I'm trying to do TikTok, but my kids are so good at it. I'm scared to do it. I think I'll just embarrass them. And um, yeah, LinkedIn. Sometimes I'm on Reddit, but that's another scary place. I'm always like, I'm a, I just am there to listen and learn. Yeah. Reddit's scary for a different reason than TikTok. Reddit's <laughs> Reddit. I like to, I like to creep in and troll forums to see what people really think when they think no one's exactly. watching. It's like a harsh crowd. Yeah. And on TikTok, I'm just not sure if we're being told the truth about the ownership and the st- the stuff that's happening, not on TikTok, not being recorded and taken while we're on TikTok, which was happening last year. And it just kind of went away. I didn't hear any declarations that said, oh, we're no longer uh, recording your your keystrokes. I, I, I haven't. I think so. we just need to assume that that's happening. Yeah. <laughs> like it's. I mean, honestly, people are like, oh, there's cameras everywhere. I'm like, you know what? I think I'm so recorded around. Everywhere. Like there's no hiding. I'm just going to be there and yeah. whatever people see me do, they see me do. And I'm not going to care anymore. Like it's just. Yeah. I fun fact about me. And I've talked about this before. I, I actually sent a letter to the NSA through the freedom of information act to find out and see if they would send me an entire dossier on what they've collected on me. And they sent me a non-denial denial letter, which it told me they do have a dossier on me. Wow. And, uh, it's, it's like unbelievable. I'm like, I just want, I just want all my nudes back. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll end on this. Your, your credo is I love people. I laugh a lot and I believe in the good in the world with all that's going on in today's world. What keeps you positive and hopeful? People, people and sort of that energy of the love and energy and kindness of that energy in itself is so powerful and so strong. And I see it like all the people I've been interviewing for race. um, They have, some have gone through so much, but their love, is greater than all the pain. And I think we forget that. Um, I wake up every morning. I can't wait to get out of bed and start my day because there are so much good in the world. We just, that's not what's on the news. Yep. Turn off the news, get out and see the sun, let the sun Power see down. you. Yeah. Yep. If you're, if you're feeling small, step outside your house and look at your shadow when the sun shines on you, you'll be bigger than your own house. And go meet people like Sheila out in the world and she'll share a smile and a drink with you for sure. And I'll do the same. Sheila, this has been wonderful. I I hope we get around to, I have so many more I could have asked you and uh, this has been an absolute blast. Thank you so much. Oh, Chris, it was great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Anytime. Talk soon. Okay. Bye. Bye.